Hello, everybody. It's so great to see you on this hot afternoon. It's so hot here in Calabar. I wonder how is it in your area? Down in the comments, I would really, really, really love to know. So on the more serious side, my name is Professor Eiz Debasi. I'm a professor of chemical pathology in the Department of Clinical Chemistry and Immunology in the University of Calabar. And uh, I teach endocrinology, bioris management, supply chain management, amongst other things. And I'm so happy to be your host on the bio risk management series. Today, we are doing a very interesting topic. Guess what? We are doing bio safety levels in bio risk management. I think you're going to enjoy this. So we're doing bio safety levels in bio risk management. Um, you can see these people, they are so well kitted from head to toe. That's because they are dealing with very dangerous organisms. And you want to be very, very careful. You want to protect yourself because you're not just protecting lives on the outside. You're also protecting yourself, your family. So you need uh, to be well kitted. You need to know what kind of organisms you're working with, what is their safety level, so that you know how to approach these things. Like this, this picture says, picture is worth a thousand words. If you have to work, do it well, dress well, and act well. All right, so what would I expect you to know at the end of this presentation or at the end of this module? I would expect you to be able to define uh, biosafety and bio-risk management. I've done that in a lot of my other videos. Please check them out before you check this one out. I think you will enjoy this one also. Uh, we need you to be able to know the importance of biosafety in laboratories and healthcare settings. And we also want you to have a brief overview of the biosafety levels. Um, biosafety actually refers to you know containment principles, technologies, and you know procedures that you implement to prevent unintentional exposure to pathogens and toxins. While bio risk management is the process of identifying, assessing, and mitigating the risk associated with handling biological agents and Together, they help us to live safely, to work safely, and also to protect the public. So interestingly, what is bio-risk? It is the combination, actually, of the probability of harm and the severity of that harm. How probably is it that this thing is harmful? And how bad can it harm you? All right, so the severity of the harm resulting from exposure to biological agents. And we have to key components. We have the biosafety components, which we want to prevent, you know, the organisms from infecting the people working with them, their families and the public. And biosecurity, where we want to prevent people who have bad intent from getting to those organisms and using them for unethical uses. All right. So an effective biomanagement, virus management system will integrate both to minimize the risk in biological research and clinical settings. So what is the risk assessment process overview? We said that one of you know, the very important uh, parts of uh, virus management is risk assessment. So we want to be able to, one, identify the potential hazards, and risk, we want to be able also, secondly, to analyze the risk that are associated with those hazards. We also want to be able to evaluate the risk and determine control measures, and then implement the control measures and monitor uh, the effectiveness of those measures we put in place. And this will help to identify what kind of biosafety level the agent belongs to and how to handle that agent. All right. So um, for biosafety levels, we actually have four levels, uh, biosafety levels one, two, biosafety levels four. And for each of these levels, we have increasing levels of containment, safety practices, and, you know, uh, facility requirements. And they are coded just the way I put it them. The level one is green, which means it's good to go. Um, in level one, we are dealing with uh, pathogens that are non-pathogenic, like your E. coli K12. For the BSL-2, it's a little bit more dangerous, and we need much more, 
much more containment. So it's a moderate risk and we need moderate containment for agents causing us diseases like um, salmonella, like stiff those areas. Uh, for the BSL-3, we are getting higher. These are getting to the big boys. Um, strict containment is needed with respiratory protection for agents that are causing severe diseases like M tuberculosis. We've had cases where people who did not, you know, uh, take care of themselves while working with this got infected. All right, then BSL-4, these are the big guns. These are the bosses, you know, <laughs> any little thing, <laughs> you are gone. So for these ones, we need maximum containment for the most dangerous agents. And these agents include things like um, Ebola and the Marburg virus, okay? So let's look at the BSL-1, just have a brief overview. Uh, the organisms here, like I have said, is an uh, E. coli K12. And uh, the kind of practices are just the standard microbiological, you know, practices. Um, you need lab coats and gloves, and you don't need any special containment requirements. You could actually use this as a teaching lab, a secondary school lab, and all that. Okay, for um, BSL-2, you have moderate risk, and it's actually suitable for diagnostic work and research involving human pathogens, like the kind of labs you see in the teaching hospitals, in the general hospitals, specialist hospitals, and the work with organisms such as um, salmonella, HIV, hepatitis. And um, the practices, safety practices you should do is to assess restriction. Like I have said in my other videos, not everybody should have access to the lab should also have an autoclave for taking care of organisms after using them and warning signs pasted everywhere. You should wear protective equipment like um, gloves, lab coats, your face protection, and you should actually have biosafety cabinets, at least class two uh, in such labs and a limited access. Not everybody should have access to the lab. So BSL-3, high risk, these are labs that are designed specially for airborne pathogens. You know that if you look at means of uh, routes of exposure, air is one of the most dangerous routes of exposure. So um, these are for organisms like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, SARS-CoV-2, okay, those are airborne pathogens. For your protective equipment, you actually need respirators, you need um, gowns, you need eye protection. The practices in uh, controlled access. In fact, even the people working in the normal lab, if you are not actually to work in that particular lab, you shouldn't have access. Only people working in that lab should have access. And when they finish working, they have to decontaminate all of the waste. And even things that they have worn have to be decontaminated in the lab. And the facility must have negative airflow. We must have sealed windows to avoid those things escaping and jumping out of the window and specialized ventilation to make sure that those things do not go out into the public. For the BSL-4, these are the big boys, so they need maximum containment. And these labs are very, very rare and they are used for life-threatening agents that have no treatment. So please, if you are not certified, do not go play near these places. They are for big boys who are trained to actually work in that place. And the organisms they use there include Ebola, Marburg viruses, full air body. Uh, the PPE you should wear should be full body and air supplied suits. You should have complete isolation and medical surveillance to make sure nobody else is tampering, to make sure that people with playful intentions, bad intentions, untrained intentions do not get there there. Uh, we have um, PPE we should use should be full-bodied air supply suits and the facility should be an isolated building or area with specialized with disposal, all right? So um, the um, facility uh, design and engineering control should have directional airflow, uh, HEPA uh, filtration, decontamination systems, airlock and sealed enclosures, and the facilities must align with the biosafety level and ensure containment and protection. So 
for each you know biosafety level you have greater containment practices and all that so your facility design should be able to take care of that and then um also uh your personnel should be trained 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 they should be trained to know how to use ppe properly they should be trained on how to deal with emergency response procedures they should have routine drills and even be certified they should also be able to adhere to standard operating procedures and um, training staff ensures that those staff will have a uh, competency to deal with these uh, agents and it also minimizes the risk of exposure as well as full blown uh, public epidemics. So why are we so disturbed about uh, biosafety in practice? Because one of the things that we are actually concerned about amongst other things that we are concerned about is laboratory acquired infections. It's not a laughing matter. A person may leave the lab with a mycobacterium a tuberculosis. If he's living in a densely populated area, can cause an epidemic in less than one month. All right. So we need uh, to be able to carry out these biosafety practices to be able to avoid infections that come from the lab. What are the common causes of this lab acquired infection? If you do not use PPE properly, if you fo fail to follow standard uh, operating procedures, do not decontaminate your wastes, and you do not report incidents that happen maybe due to flare of pain, you could have lab acquired infections occurring. And the consequences of what will happen that happens is that you are putting both your health at risk and the health of the community. You will lose public trust in scientific research and they will shut down your lab. Once they shut down your lab, you can't get funding, you can't get a salary. So what do we learn from all this? That you need a strong safety culture, not just equipment, not just facility, but you need to develop a culture you know, of safety. And this is vital. So personnel, also must feel safe to report incidents, receive training, and be empowered to stop unsafe uh, practices. Things are evolving every day. There's nobody that is greater than training. So please train, train, and retrain. In conclusion, I would like to say that biosafety and virus management are vital to public health and research integrity. I would also like to say that each biosafety level is tailored to the risk posed by the biological agent, and you should have a strong safety culture as well as continuously educate yourself to be able to know what are the current things to happen. I want to say thank you for attention. I welcome your questions and thoughts. If you do have any contributions, please put them in the comment sections. And like I always say, it's a free resource, so don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Thank you so much for your time. If you do have any questions again, please let's see them in the comments. I'd like to say thank you to Slides Go and Flaticon and Free Peak for the use of their slides and their icons as well as images.